This is Jane Lo, and I'm at uh, Drones Asia 2023 at Marina Bay Sands and the downtown core area of Singapore. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Mark Hof, who is the uh, senior manager of uh, UAV and UTM at uh, Imaset Aviation. So thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Good morning, Jane. Pleasure thank to be here. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Mark, you're going to be talking to us about uh, UAVs uh, in Aviation 2.0. So I thought we can talk about you know that from three angles, about the user's adoption, about technology, and of course about security and uh, safety, which is a big concern for many people. Sure. Right? Okay, so let's start with our users, right? So when we talk about UAV for our um, audience who's not too familiar with what it stands for, it's an unmanned aviation vehicle. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. Uh, uh, these days, we actually use the term uncrewed oh, rather oh, than unmanned. Yeah, um, uncrewed, yeah. of course. Right. And actually, that's, that's a nice segue because uh, we're moving on from legacy aviation into a new world. Mm. And so this technology, some people refer to it as UAV, and you, you, you go into Acronym City, AAM, Advanced Air Mobility, right, or Innovative Air Mobility, right, and yes. drones, and all, all right. these terms, right? But ultimately, what we're talking about, we're talking about the next generation of aviation coming right. through. And, and part of that journey is making sure that we, we learn from the past and take away what's good, but equally improve um, based on what we know today and apply those lessons also. So one of them is, is that we move away from gender-specific type terms and we make it accessible to everybody. So these days we're called it uncrewed aviation. Thank, thank you, Mark, for that uh, explanation. So uh, when, we, when we talk about uncrewed aviation, right? Um, so we are talking about use cases in the uh, areas of uh, remote sensing, surveillance, uh, surveying. So a whole lot of uh, use cases compared to the old, I guess, the legacy world of aviation. So tell us about all these uh, new potential use cases and applications. Absolutely. So if, if you compare legacy aviation to this new world of aviation 2.0, the legacy aviation ultimately is about moving passengers from, from destination A to destination B mm. and, and moving cargo, and that, that is their core business. Um, the big difference with aviation 2.0 is it's, that it's driven by the business community. So you have a, um, the business community will look at use cases and business cases that are driven from a um, commercial perspective rather than from a legacy aviation perspective. So they apply these new technologies, which are using these uncrewed platforms, and they create a business case around it, and then really it starts falling into an aviation world. So the segmentation within aviation 2.0 is interesting. It's very diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes all the way from uh, Cessna type uh, uh, aircraft uncrewed for cargo transportations in, say, Africa, all the way down to smaller, what we call drones or quadcopters right, of course, yes. that can be used for inspection and surveillance. What we do at Imasat, we basically have four classes where we're segmented into. Right. We have inspection and surveillance. Okay. Then we have cargo, small cargo, small cargo, larger cargo, say more than 100 kilograms. And then we're looking at urban and mobility air taxis. Right. And I'll come to that question later. Sure. <laughs> and, and if I could just give you one example, the, the part of the industry that is taking off today, no pun intended, is inspection and surveillance and, and to a degree delivery. Um, and this is all about applying this technology for, for good. We call it drones for good. So an example could be um, COVID vaccination deliveries in remote locations. Right. Um, there might be particular uh, deliveries around uh, medical deliveries in Africa or the World Food Program by the mm. United Nations. So those are the kind of use cases that we apply uh, using this new technology. Another one would be the ecosystem, bird wildlife. Mm -hmm. If you have the remote islands in, in the Pacific uh, where we want to avoid any type of contamination, maybe rat infestations. So we use these technologies yeah to access remote islands or remote areas and make sure that we mm. deliver um, on the business case, which is about making the environment that we live in just a, a better place to be in. So talking about new technologies, right? So Imaset, I think a lot of the audience, um, or our audience will be familiar with Imaset in the areas of satellite and satellite communications technology, right? So if I understand you right, uh, you are transferring or transforming or translating some of these uh, technology that you are very good at, harnessing you know, the, uh, the, 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 the features and using them in drones or aviation 2.0. Tell us more about that. That is correct. So, so at its core, Imasat operates a constellation of satellites. There's 15 of them in orbit today. And they provide a data link service from the satellites to planet Earth. And they can be applied in the maritime sector. Uh, they can be applied what we call enterprise or mm -hmm. land services, but also aviation. So what we have done is we've taken our core technology that we apply in aviation, commercial air transport. We miniaturized it. And if I could just, right. oh, crikey, there we are. 
So if of I just take yes. this this terminal here, this is a um, an L bump terminal, which is specific, specifically designed for the use in um, uncrewed aviation. So it's smaller, it's lighter, power consumption is less, and it's also a lot more affordable from a capex uh, perspective. Then so this is like 300 grams, if I understand that right. That is correct. Yes, yeah. So that's a 300 gram terminal, and this is all in. So this includes the antenna. So it's one what we call LIU, so line replaceable unit. Uh, equally, we even have a smaller version. Oh, right. Okay. So this is a full SATCOM terminal bar the antenna. So say you have an operator that has a platform that are concerned about weight and balance of yeah. the aircraft, or maybe uh, blades like a quadcopter, right. you can have the antenna in a separate place. And this is a real game changer. This is unique in the industry because it uses the EMASAT, what we call the L-band network, which right. is a connectivity data link that we yeah. apply in commercial mm -hmm. and transport. So that same data link, and then we use this new hardware, this new technology, <coughs> which fits on the smaller platforms that are being used in Aviation 2.0. So this is extremely exciting. This is a real game changer. So you talk about L-band, right? So tell us how important and why is it important when it comes to drones? Yeah, so uh, without getting too technical about it, but it's a really good question and really important to highlight this. So uh, for satellite communications, you have different types of, of data link. Uh, you have KU-band, KA-band, won't go into the details, right. but for example, KA-band is more for passenger Wi-Fi. But then we have this L-band frequency, so it's a smaller pipe, um, but it's better resilient. So that mm. pipe is basically weather interference, rain interference. Okay. And that's why that data link is being used for commercial uh, transport. So we're looking at CPDLC, so controller pilot data link communications, fans mm. communications mm. for commercial air transport, for uh, aircraft to communicate with air traffic management. It's that data link because it's safe, it's secure, and it's an extremely stable link. So we're applying those same standards that we use for commercial aviation for uncrewed aviation. And of course, uh, when it comes to uncrewed aviation, reliability is a big, uh, well, important critical factor. So that's why you have this L-band as, as well, if I understand you right. Absolutely, completely spot on. So safety is, is critical. It's right. a, you you mm. know, we always say in aviation, you have three priorities, and they are safety, safety, and safety. That, that's, you know, that's how we approach the topic. We have to um, understand that the volume of traffic is going to increase significantly with this new technology. Yes, that's right. So how do we manage all these platforms in this airspace that sits around us? And that's one thing flying a platform in a remote location, say a railroad inspection in Canada or mm. uh, oil platform inspections out, out, out in the water, uh, all the way to air taxis maybe in an urban environment. So we have to make sure that we use the latest technology and technology that's been mm -hmm. proven with very high reliability and we apply those standards for this, this, these kind of solutions that are out there in the market. And the last thing I'll say on the topic is to be able to tr manage this traffic, there's not enough humans, there's not enough mm. air traffic controllers mm. to, to manage all this increase in volume. So we have to use IoT, we have to use uh, AI, to manage these, these sets of data link. Okay. And that's again where l comes into play. All oh, right, okay. So can you expand a little bit about all this AI and data aggregation sort of, um, wh wh where's the industry at in terms of, I understand there's a lot of uh, conversations around interoperability data standards. Tell us where, where the industry is. Correct. So again, you remember the beginning of our conversation, we said that this, this world is driven by the business case. So it's not just flying the, the platform from A to B, it's everything that, that sits around it. Mm. And then we're also thrown to the mix, there's no pilot on these platforms, right? And then it's flying in an airspace that sits above our head. So it's very important that we know we understand who is flying where, mm. where is it going to, what's its purpose, what is its ID, so we call that remote ID, remote identification. Mm -hmm. But then also that data that needs to be distributed to other clients on the ground, which is what we call SWIM, so system-wide information management. Okay. So the uh, ATM environment needs to know, maybe the customers on the ground need to know, maybe the authorities need to know if you're gonna fire a platform over Singapore here downtown, I'm sure that the police and the fire authorities would like to understand right. who is flying and what they're doing. So it's taken this technology that allows this data and these data sets to be distributed mm -hmm. amongst multiple customers. And for, for that we use a software-defined wireless area network, so SD1. So you take a set of data and it allows you to distribute the data across multiple mm -hmm. clients that need to have access to, to this data. So you talk about safety, 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 which is the number one priority for, of course, for UAVs. You don't want the drones to just drop down you know, from the sky. So tell us, when you speak to the regulators, to your stakeholders, to your partners, right? Uh, what are the concerns around this you know, safety priority? 
I think um, when we talk about the, the regulatory environment, which is very much a hot topic, every event that you'll go to, it's all about the regulator and the regulator facilitating mm -hmm. this, this technology. It's, it's really important that we explain to the regulator what it is that we're trying to do. We're not talking about legacy aircraft, A320s and 737 MAX aircraft. These are platforms they might not be familiar with. They fly at different altitudes and they might fly at different attitudes. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we engage the regulator about the technology that we're bringing into the market. And then the second tier is, is that we bring the regulator along with us. So we have to prove to the regulator that this is proven technology and it's safe technology. Mm -hmm. It's probably technology that they are familiar with. It's just being used in a slightly different way. And once we have those conversations with the regulator, they can then allow us, this industry here, mm. with a set of standards for, for the community here in Singapore, but of course much further afield, to deploy the services they want to bring to the community. Right, so and what is the number one sort of concern that the people have when it comes to safety at the moment? I, I think, um, it's, it's so I might give you a slightly um, an interesting answer maybe in that front. I don't think necessarily it's about drones flying in, in, into buildings per se. I think that technology is, is, is already proven that they won't. It's more about safety of privacy. Right, I see, so, okay. So, you know, when people walk in urban environments, are they going to feel like they're going to be watched all the time? Right, right. Is it about noise interference? Okay. Is it about drones flying in their backyard mm. or around hotels? Mm. So it's that kind of you know, invasion of, of, of privacy that is the oh, main right, concern. Okay. So public engagement is extremely important. Earlier I spoke about taking the regulator along with us, mm. but it's equally as important that we take the public, the general public course, with us. Of course, yes, that's right. That's why these events are so important. That's why what you do is so mm. important, because people can listen to us, they can educate themselves, mm. they can come to events like this here in, in Singapore, Drones Asia, and we have to tell them, well, this is not going to interfere with your private life. This mm -hmm. is not a safety or security risk. In fact, this is going to enhance your day-to-day -day life from when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, mm. This technology should make your life just a, an easier, more pleasant way to, to go about your, your daily routine. So talking about education and raising awareness right, for the public, right? And I think um, when uh, most of the audience will think, ah, right, when we hear about Aviation 2.0, it's about air taxis, right? Um, so tell us where the, where, what, what do you think is the public's awareness about what Aviation 2.0 means and what is you know, when air taxi is going to happen and all these uh, privacy sort of concerns. Where, where's the public's awareness? Are we at the infancy stage or it's again still a, very, a lot of work to do? Uh, well, it's again, it's a very good question. So when you look at this technology, it, most of the attention goes to air taxis. Because I don't know if you remember this series in the 1960s, the Jetsons, which was all about this cartoon series of people mm. flying in, in air taxis from That's A right, to yeah. B. Back at, this is like yeah. 60 years ago, right? People are already talking about it. So it resonates with the public. It, you see the movies and science fiction music, so, uh, science fiction movies. So people are really intrigued. Ultimately, though, what people don't see, and I'll come back to the air taxis in a second, is that this technology, which is maybe less visible is out there um, doing surveillance in a maritime environment, making mm. sure that people don't drown, maybe refugees who are trying to get to shore. That doesn't get all the headlines all no, the time. No, it doesn't, no. It is the air taxis, it's right? It's not quite glamorous. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So again, the education piece is important. Now, in, in my opinion, or our opinion, air taxis are under development. They're still mm. very much in the design phase, in the proof of concept phase. Um, some of the, the large OEMs are, are actively involved in developing air taxis. It will come. I think it will be a phased approach um, by some. Some organizations want to go completely uncrewed. Some companies want to go maybe with one pilot. I think initially the use case is going to be in cities like, like Singapore, but also cities like Dubai, maybe flying from, from the airport to the Burj mm. Khalifa. Uh, and, but it has to be a phased approach. We call that a controlled entry into service. Oh, of course, yes. And we have to, again, prove the technology and make sure that people feel safe and comfortable. Oh, of course, yeah. Stepping on an aircraft with no pilot on board is going to be a whole new right, environment. Right, exactly, right, exactly, yeah, right. So, so it is coming. Like I said, it's getting all the bright, shiny lights. Uh, it's very exciting, of course. Um, ultimately, it's what they call you know, a, a game changer probably about five, six years away before you're going to see it in any great, great numbers being deployed. Five, in, six in years, that's not too long. Which is not too long, no, absolutely. So it's before you know it, in, in five years when you come to this show again, you know, we'll have air taxis taking you, and you from will, your hotel to the You conference. and I will be sharing an air taxi <laughs> together, for <laughs> sure. That will be fun. Absolutely. Right. So on that note, thank you so much, Mark, for your time today. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care.